Welcome to Cascade.cloud, your AWS cloud experts. So why do customers choose Cascade? Some are tired of incurring expensive purchases just to keep systems going, continuously having to add additional hardware and servers just to make sure that their systems keep pace with their growing business. Others are just extremely frustrated with system instability and the daily ups and downs of their IT environment. Some are just worried about security and compliance. And others need to ensure that they have disaster recovery and backup and ensuring that their systems are continuously protected at all times. Many just want to get that project going without the huge capex outlay. So why not make the move to Cascade.cloud today? From startup to enterprise, Cascade has a solution customized to your needs, leveraging the world's largest cloud computing platform used by more than 1 million companies around the world. We'll move you to the cloud safely and securely, manage your costs and resources, and help you access technology that drives returns instead of draining resources so you can focus on your business. Make the move now to the cloud that has been chosen by over 1 million customers. Contact Cascade.cloud today. For more information, email info at cascade.cloud. We're looking forward to chatting to you. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's Kevin Derman here chatting to you, and I just want to make sure that you can all hear me. So if you can, do pop me a message just uh, in that chat window and just say, yes, we can hear you. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that uh, small video um, over there just explaining what Cascade does. And um, without any further ado, I'll get stuck in. So uh, yes, I can I've got a whole lot of replies saying loud and clear. Great, awesome. So um, let's uh, let's start off with the digital dreamscape presentation. Um, so firstly, I have a, uh, a con confession uh, to make about this particular presentation. Um, whenever I give this presentation, it is with um, a certain degree of anxiousness that accompanies it, and uh, the the anxiousness is not about um, actually doing the presentation or anything like that. It's really about the aspect of discussing this concept of time. So I don't know about any of you out there, but I certainly feel that time is going faster and faster. The pace of things is, is really accelerating. And I'm left with this kind of feeling that there just isn't enough time to do everything um, that one wants to do. And um, it's actually been this way for me for quite some time. And I've, I've looked into several avenues of why do we experience that time is going faster and faster and faster. And the first answer that I was able to uh, kind of achieve with this is the unfortunate um, concept is this concept of aging. And this is why we experience it. So when you are one year old, one year old in your life, um, that one year is 100% of your life. So you experience that time as a significant ch chunk and you feel the length of it. But when you are um, 50 years of age, that one year is 1 50th of your life. So you feel it at a much faster pace. So um, this, what you're seeing on your screen um, now, is, uh, is not a Plascon swatch for you to choose your uh, latest color of your room, but it really is a representation of how we experience time. 
So you see that one year is that big chunk in the beginning, but as we get to the end of, say, let's say a 100-year lifespan, it's a thin little slither that we feel that that is the period of time. So um, when you're 90, that one year is that 1.11% of your life, and the more time you've lived, the shorter each year feels. So this is a rather unfortunate um, thing because there's there's actually no way to to really get around it, and there's no way to uh, to avoid aging, unfortunately, at this stage. So uh, we definitely will um, experience it. So it didn't really um, bring me any degree of satisfaction against this anxiety around time and I still was left with this uh, particular problem. So now I started thinking, okay, what else can we do in order to uh, decrease this, uh, this feeling and how do we maximize the amount of time that we have because that's uh, the option. So I started looking at what do we spend our time doing. And the first thing that I looked at is we spend a large chunk of our time actually sleeping. So if you think about seven to eight hours a day on average, that's if the average person speak, sleeps, and you add that up over time, we land up sleeping 25 years of our lives away. Um, and that's in the average lifespan of what we're at at the moment, uh, which is 78. The global average is about 78. So 25 years is spent sleeping. So this, to me, was the first initial thing that I said, okay, well, well if I can reduce the amount of time that I sleep, um, then I can get a whole lot of time back to do things. Uh, so try sleeping four hours a night and you'll learn very quickly that unfortunately all that it does is it makes your waking hours more of a misery and uh, you are not um, very productive in those waking hours. So this is not a solution. So what is the rest of the time that uh, we spend in our lives spent doing? Well, working is obviously the next thing and we spend if you add it all up it's about 10.3 years of our lives that we spend working we've got to get to and fro from work so we drive to work drive home and all of that driving adds up to 4.3 years of our lives when we get home we want to cook a meal uh, and we land up spending 2.5 years of our lives cooking we spend 3.66 years of our lives eating 1.1 years of our lives cleaning up after uh, we have eaten and then of course there's nothing better than after you've eaten a wonderful meal to sit back and watch some TV and all of that TV that we um, spend our time watching adds up to 9.1 years of watching TV and that's without binge watching Game of Thrones. Uh, those of you who are very very keen on Game of Thrones and any of the other wonderful series on Netflix for example. So that's a substantial amount of time uh, that we spend. We spend 1.5 years of our lives going in the in the bathroom and of that 1.5 years of our lives, 92 days of it is spent on the toilet. We spend 48 days having sex and uh, don't worry, I can see there must be quite a lot of you out there who are panicked by that statement. It's, it's not 48 days consecutively. So if you're trying to measure yourself in comparison, don't worry, you've still got a lot of time to make up those 48 days. Um, the average woman spends one year of her life staring into a cupboard, wondering what to wear. And if you think that's bad, the average man spends one year of his life just staring at women. So not even worrying what to wear. Now you add all of that up, add up all of the sleeping, uh, all of the, the cooking, the driving, eating, uh, toilet, etc., etc., and you come up to 57.4 years, 57.4 years. So uh, subtract that from the global average and we're not left with a lot of time left that we can choose what we want to do with that particular time. And if you take that many of those early years are spent in diapers um, and many of the later years of that are spent in diapers, it really comes down to we have a roughly about like 10 years that we have any say in what we do. So time is very, very precious. And 
Einstein says that time is an illusion. And unfortunately, with all of this information and the information that uh, Einstein, who's certainly a very clever guy, so if he says it's an illusion, I, I kind of believe him. Uh, but it doesn't help. It doesn't help in thinking of it as an illusion. So what does help? Well, I came across this guy. And this guy's name is Professor Aubrey de Grey. And Aubrey de Grey is a biomedical gerontologist. And he studies aging and anti-aging techniques. He is the head of a, an institute called the Sense Institute. I would encourage you to go and have a look at sense.org, S-E-N-S.org, and have a look at some of the work that they're doing. But most importantly, Aubrey de Grey made the statement that said the person who is going to live to be 1,000 years old has already been born. A thousand years old. And when I, I shared this fact, I've got a five-year-old son, and I, I told him about this uh, particular fact. And he very cutely said to me, Dad, do you think it's me? <laughs> and actually, it could be him. It could be him. Um, because this technology is accelerating. And we're going to be discussing some of these technologies during today's presentation. We're talking about things here of cellular regeneration, organ regeneration and replacement. So this fascinating technology that is uh, coming through over here. So the objective of this talk is for you to feel the change that we are going through. I would love it if you could see the opportunities for you in this particular process. See what is uh, available um, there and how to really capitalize on those opportunities and to be part of the process as opposed to somebody who is sitting on the side um, looking on and saying, well, I'm just going to let the future happen to me. You have the opportunity here to be part of this process. I don't know how many of you have actually thought about what this world looks like over the next 30 to 35 years. Is it going to be this futuristic world with cars flying around the sky and fantastic buildings like we're looking at over there? In fact, this image that I'm showing you right now, Santon looks very similar to, <laughs> to what it is. So we're getting closer and closer to this. But there are people that are looking at this and some of the brightest minds in the world are looking at what does the next 30 years look like and there's a, a, a project called the Millennium Project which is funded by the United Nations where they have these 58 nodes around the world with some of the smartest thinkers looking at the biggest areas that are going to affect our lives over the next 30 to 35 years. And these 15 points over here are some of the elements that they are examining and that they are finding solutions to. So if you look at things like clean water, climate change, population and resources, etc., you can read through the rest of those 15 over there. But I want to really hone in on this number 14, which is science and technology, and that's the area where we play in. And you can see that there's this mesh network that is happening on this globe that you can see because science and technology has the ability to affect so many of the other areas as well. So let's take an example over here of clean water. Well, clean water is a major issue uh, in the world today. There's so much, so many people that don't have access to clean water. And that can certainly be solved by science and technology and desalination as an example and um, uh, filtration plants is another example. So if you solve that, it has a knock-on effect, though, because solving the clean water problem means less people will die because of dirty water or polluted water. And that obviously has a knock-on effect to number three, increasing the population and increasing the demands on the resources. So how do you solve that? Well, you solve that by obviously increasing the amount of resources that are, that are there. And again, science and te technology has a part to play. So the area that we're in really is so critical to the survival of humanity. Change is coming. There is no doubt about that. But what I hope to show you during today's presentation is that it's not about change that's coming. The change is here. We are currently living through it at the moment. We are experiencing it on a daily basis. And the pace is increasing and is going faster and faster and faster. The next slide I want to discuss, <clears throat> you'll see on the screen in a moment, 
is Gartner's hype curve. And this is the 2018 hype curve. And I'm going to be discussing this in, in some detail. I'm going to be discussing some of the technologies on this. This comes out every year between July and August time frame. And it's really a very exciting time for me when it comes out because I get to see what are the technologies that are going to impact us over the next couple of years. So Gartner uh, explains that there are a couple components on this. And the first one is there's an innovation trigger where the, in the, the technology is introduced. Um, it then goes through a peak of inflated expectation where the technology is deemed as the next best thing that is going to solve so many of our problems in our lives. And then it goes through the trough of disillusionment. It goes through a time where something happens where, uh, if you think about the cloud world, there were the initial security issues that uh, it went through um, where people became disillusioned with the cloud and realized that you had to have good security in the cloud as well. And it wasn't the panacea for all of these um, security issues. And then over time, it goes up the slope of enlightenment and eventually the plateau of productivity. Now, let's have a look at some of the things that are in the latest um, Gartner Hype Curve that are going there. Well, here's flying autonomous vehicles. We have things like smart dust, 4D printing. We have exoskeletons. We have edge AI, um, digital twins, uh, deep neural nets for deep learning. Uh, we have quantum computing, and I'm going to be speaking about some of these. Now, if you're looking at these things and you're thinking, well, um, you know, Kevin is, is really um, smoking something here that if he thinks that these are really going to be uh, coming into our reality anytime soon, well, I just want to take you to the 2009 um, Gartner's hype curve. And let's have a look at some of the things that were on the hype curve then. At the bottom, we have 3D flat panel displays, and these were just making its way up as a, they were in a technology trigger at that point, making its way up the peak of inflated expectation. Well, if, if we took account of how many people have 3D televisions nowadays, you know, you'd see that the majority of TVs that are capable of this, and it is very much a reality. Still, on that technology trigger, 3D printing was moving its way up there, augmented reality. Um, 3D printing, you can go into any incredible connection and buy a 3D printer nowadays. You know, it's certainly not uh, this thing that is this mysterious technology. Right at the top of the peak of inflated expectation was cloud computing and ebook readers. Ebook readers, no ways, uh, people had said, they, these are not going to become part of reality. We still want books. Well, most people, you know, read books nowadays on a Kindle, so it's certainly part of our reality. So when you view it like that, you can see that this hype curve certainly, certainly becomes our reality. So let's go back to our most recent one and look at some of these things. The first one over there is flying autonomous vehicles. And uh, one aspect where Gartner has been wrong over the recent years with their hype curve is that they would estimate over there flying autonomous vehicles as a good example to reach the plateau of productivity in more than 10 years. More than 10 years. Well, um, I beg to differ on a lot of these technologies, and I think that we certainly will be seeing these things within the next five years. They will be mainstream within the next five years because of the curve of, of accelerating technology that we are on. So I'm going to show you a, a, a quick video just to, uh, to demonstrate uh, this. Right, so what you're seeing over here is one of the um, world's first autonomous drones. And this drone, uh, produced by a company called Ehang, um, has been supplied into uh, Dubai where it's going to be an Uber type service where people are able to call for a drone from their app, their app on their phone.
the drone will arrive and it's as you can see there holds one person in the drone and it's got a little bit of space in the back for uh, some luggage you will put in your destination it knows where it can take off and where it can land from and just like you go and you meet an uber outside your hotel and it knows where that parking place is so it will be the same for these drones um, it has been tested in severe bad weather and is incredibly uh, safe and this will be a reality um, for us very very soon as well as well so just coming back to the presentation Just getting it back. Apologies. Right, we're back. Um, <clears throat> I just want to uh, take a, a quick poll on those autonomous uh, drones uh, that are, are there. Now, these are uh, an anonymous uh, poll, so don't worry about it. Um, don't worry about you being <laughs> identified. But I just want to know, <clears throat> would you um, take one of these autonomous drones uh, now, this Uber-style drone? Would you, if it was available today, uh, would you call for it? Um, or would you wait until you know, it's been in the market for at least a year until you would have the guts to to go and uh, and do that? I'll share the results uh, with you in a in a moment. Okay, cast your votes now. Okay, closing the votes in three, two, one, and close. And I'll share that with you. Okay, so what are the results over here from uh, the people who are on? Well, 71% of you said, yes, you would do it. And 29% and, uh, said, well, after I've seen others use it for a year. But interestingly, no no's. So what we've got here is a clear indication that we've got on uh, the webinar today, a lot of early adopters, 70% uh, of your early adopters. And 30% are a little bit uh, cautious on it and saying, well, you know, I want to make sure these things aren't falling out of the sky uh, before I go on that. So those Gartner technologies are um, classed in three main areas. And those main areas are AI everywhere, transparently immersive experiences, and digital platforms. And uh, they're nicely put in this particular graph. And I'm going to dig down into a couple of those um, areas as well. The first one that um, I want to look at is the smart uh, dust. Smart dust is something that will really overtake IoT um, in its use. And if you have a look at that finger that's over there and you look at that tiny little black speck that's on that finger, that is the size of the smart um, dust. And um, I don't know whether you have sat in the bedroom or wherever you are and you've seen the sun streaming through the window and you can see the, that dust in the air. This is the size of these particles and they have the ability to actually collect data about the atmosphere around them and they can then transmit that data to a central source. So if you think about a, a central edge device, for example, picking up all of the data, sending it to the cloud for analysis and being able to understand more about that environment. What are the, um, the utilizations and use cases for this? They range from understanding pollution in the atmosphere. Think about spreading a whole lot of these smart dust motes into the atmosphere and we can then go and understand what pollutants they are. You can understand the wind speeds as these smart dust motes get taken through the environment and, and blown about. 
huge amount of data that will come back from these, but also we can actually ingest them in foods and drinks, and we can actually pick up things in our bloodstream and have constant information coming out from these smart dust motes. So it might be that these have the ability to then bring us to the next layer of healthcare as well by sharing that internal information of the body. And you'll see in a moment how that can actually be um, achieved as well. Next concept that I want to discuss is the concept of the digital twin. Simulations um, is nothing new to the computer environment. We've been running simulations for many, many, many years and using computers to run these simulations. The biggest issue that has, happens with simulations is it only takes the data that you're putting in right at the beginning of the simulation. So what does the digital twin accomplish? It takes that ability of running a simulation, running a particular um, environmental impact on that particular device, but combining it with the real world data. So in this example on the screen at the moment, you'll see a a ship that is moving through and you'll see its digital twin and the ship is transmitting data from IoT devices up to the cloud and it is then combining that live data of what that ship is going through with the simulation data to bring about an accurate representation of what's going to happen to that vehicle. So in this case a ship is moving through um, ice, uh, the engine could be under severe strain and the simulation is predicting when is this engine going to fail and when is it going to need maintenance? So with that data going through, it can pick up what is the real world issues and what is the real world demand that's being placed on that engine, combine it with that data. So really giving a live simulation saying you need to stop that boat right now because that engine is about to pack up, it needs to be maintained, etc. Great information. Think about airplanes, think about any machinery being able to use this concept of digital twin. But it doesn't stop there. It can transmit into the human environment. And the digital twin technology market spans both the mechanical market plus the human market. So think about running a digital twin for yourself, where you have those smart dust embedded within your body, which is constantly giving up information, information on the plaque levels in your uh, bloodstream and any plaque buildup that's occurring over there, the blood flow through to your heart and through to your brain, your glucose levels, your blood pressure levels, all of that information being transmitted so that your digital twin can now start predicting, are you at risk of any health issues? Are you uh, going to be suffering from an impending heart attack within the next three days? So actually you need to go to the hospital now and have preventative measures taken for that. This opportunity for the market is going to be huge. It already runs into billions at the moment and by 2024 is going to be around about $380 billion uh, market size for that kind of technology. The concept of the human brain interface has been explored um, actually to a fair degree already in, in animals and the work that they've been done. But uh, Elon Musk has been investing in a new business called Neuralink, and Neuralink is looking at taking this into the human environment and creating a brain-computer interface for the human environment. And it's my, my personal view that this type of technology is what will save humanity um, in this new artificial, artificial intelligence world. Uh, why? Because we, there's no way that humans can actually compete with where AI Um, can you still hear me out there? My system is telling me that I've lost audio. Okay, great. I'm there. So, um, so you will have this ability to have uh, a to be augmented and. 
we actually are already augmented beings because we are just actually augmented at the end of our hand. We have the cell phone that's in our hand. And any of you who think that we're not augmented, well, I'll challenge you to go out to a dinner and not have your phone with you and see how you feel when somebody asks you a question that you don't know the answer for. We are so used to reaching for Google and for searching for these answers. So we really are augmented. But what does this mean? Uh, from having the brain-computer interface, we will have this information readily streaming into our, into our brains just by thinking about it. We've already been through large changes in our lifetime that we've experienced the internet. And just take a, a simple example over here between 2005 and 2014, the size of storage um, has increased from 128 meg on this micro SD card to 128 gigs on this card. That's a huge, huge change in the amount of storage. So we've already been through these massive accelerations. But what's going to change is the curve of the acceleration that we're on. We are used to hearing about Moore's law, and Moore's law spoke about the number of um, resistors that, that can go and fit onto a CPU chip and how the power of the CPU uh, increases. And we've been used to that kind of trajectory impacting our environment and impacting our rate of technological advancement. But now it, there are more factors that are coming into it. There are more factors that are accelerating that curve. So Moore's law doubling that capacity every 18 months. We have Fibers, Fibers law, which is uh, um, Butter's law. And Butter's law says that the amount of data coming out of an optical fiber doubles every nine months. Doubling every nine months due to technology. This law, which is Crider's law, says that the disk drive density will double every 13 months. So we've seen that, we've seen that uh, the amount of storage on a particular device. So if you're adding all of these things up, you can see that there's a compounding effect. But to me, the most important one is this bottom one, which is Metcalf's law, which says that the power of the network is N squared, where N is the number of people in that network. So here, I want you to think about the networks that we're involved in, whether it is LinkedIn, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, et cetera. If you come up with an idea nowadays, that idea can scale globally, can span globally and spread throughout this network so quickly and that sharing of that idea allows for technology um, to have a greater impact and now allows for the rate of technology to expand as well. So it's all of these things together that is compounding the rate of acceleration. Now you might be saying, well, what is that rate of acceleration now? Um, well, how do we actually quantify this rate of acceleration? Well, here is a view over the next five years what we're going to experience. Um, and the curve I'm going to show you is going to be a curve that says, well, how do we experience, how do we feel about that technology? It's very difficult to actually quantify it in terms of a, um, an, ex an example of saying, well, storage will go from um, X to Y. It's more important on how we feel about that technology. So it's our human intuitive perspective of technological advancement that we're going to be talking about over the next couple slides. Over the next five years, and on this curve you see at the bottom on the x-axis you have the number of years into the future, and on the y-axis you have the increase in current technological ability. And over the next five, we will be 32 times more advanced than we are today. So 32 times more, more advanced. And we, we kind of used to this type of advancement. And you might be thinking, well, that's quite advanced. Well, think about what's going to happen in 10 years time. In 10 years, we will be a thousand times more advanced than we are today. It makes that 32 times more advanced, that first five years of change, actually only be 3% of the total change that we're going to experience in 10 years time. So a thousand times more advanced in 10 years time. I'm sure that you feel that, wow, that is a huge amount of change that we're actually going to, uh, to experience. Well, um, is it really, is it, is it a large amount? Because actually 
We've experienced that kind of change here in nine years. If you took 2005 to 2014 with that 128 megs to 128 gigs, we've experienced it. And I think we kind of are used to that kind of momentum already. So what does it look like now in 20 years? If we were a thousand times more advanced within the first 10, what are we going to be in 20 years time from now? Well, those of you who are mathematicians out there have probably already worked that out. And it means that in 20 years, we will be a million times more advanced. It makes those first 14 years, just have a look at it, it's flat. The first 14 years, it's almost as if nothing happened during that, that time. Um, here we are looking at things like regenerative medicine. We're looking at that, that ability for us to grow new organs and have them transplanted. We're looking at um, a computer brain interface that I was speaking about earlier on. And biological photon and quantum computing really coming into the, the mainstream. And that's within that 10 to 20 year time period. Because if you look at where that hyper acceleration takes off, it's at that 16 year mark that things really start to accelerate over there. So let's dwell for a couple moments on this brain computer uh, interface aspect of it. And I mentioned that uh, these studies have already been done in the animal world and they've proven that it actually is possible. It's possible to transfer things like memories. They have taken a mouse and the mouse, put a mouse into a maze where it has to learn its way through the maze in order to get through to the cheese. Then they've taken that particular mouse, they've connected its brain to another mouse who has never been through that maze. And they've then let that mouse, second mouse, into the maze. And lo and behold, it goes straight to the cheese. It knows the way through, showing that memories are transferable. So what does that mean for us? Well, the amount of um, advancement that we have made in understanding memories and understanding where memories are formed in the brain and how they're formed and how they last and what is the decay rate of those memories, means that we actually will be able to transfer and download information into our into our brain. So if you, as an example, you are going to um, going to France for the weekend, you will be able to download French, pay for it, download French for the weekend, arrive in France, speak French for the weekend, but on Monday when you get back to the office, uh, you will say, well, bonjour, uh, and it will be a little bit sketchy, and it will start to obviously decay through the week as those memories start to fade. And I think this really will change how people um, feel about using pirated software uh, as I don't see too many people going to be willing to try some black market software that they pick up and download it into their brain because I think taking in a computer virus will have a whole new meaning at that level. So there is a lot that is going to be happening in this particular um, area as well. And uh, again, those of you who think that, uh, no, this is the stuff of science fiction, let's have a look at this particular um, video. All right, let's get uh, back to uh, the presentation. Okay, picking it up. Um, and again, after seeing that, um, I'm sure you all felt sorry for little Johnny who was um, really trying to uh, understand the question <laughs> of his enhanced classmates. Um, but this is going to be a reality. This is going to be something that we will all have the option. Do you want a brain computer uh, interface? And um, so our next poll um, that I would like to uh, share with you is, uh, would you volunteer for a brain computer interface? So you can cast your votes now um, and have a look. Okay, give you another couple seconds over there. 
last votes are coming in and we will now close off the voting and i will share it with you so uh, we had 43 percent say yes 43 percent say no and uh 14 percent um after i've seen this in action for at least a year so what does this uh, tell us well certainly that amount of early adopter um attitude decreases over here when we start speaking about um, putting things into our own body and uh, utilizing that we have some serious no's uh, on it and some of them are saying well i just want to to uh, wait a while but interesting to see how that changes from you know taking a a drone just waiting to get back to the presentation and see that you haven't got it on your screen right okay so all of these things are really accelerating the pace and these are things that we will experience I want to now take us to the 30 year time frame and in a 30 in 30 years time we will be a billion times more advanced now a billion times is incredibly difficult to explain in fact we don't really have the the language um, and the technology um, descriptions to actually speak about it we can only imagine that uh, we we're speaking about virtual assistants and artificial general intelligence and bio and nanotechnology being part of this uh, reality that we will experience in this this time frame um, and certainly we are on this uh, trajectory in order to be a billion times more advanced uh, in this 30 year time frame but it really is i think it's the equivalent of saying to somebody in the 1920s um explain the internet they would not have been able to explain the internet they would not have been able to explain many of the um, things that we take for granted in our daily life today and because of this trajectory of technological advancement that we're on we will experience the equivalent type of change in a 30-year period so very very exciting time to be alive i think it's 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 fantastic um, quantum computing is going to play a large part in getting us on that trajectory on really shifting us out of Moore's law and expanding our computing capabilities for those of you who haven't looked into what quantum computing is well we used to uh, bits and bytes and these being a binary in terms of they're either on or off there is zero or a one quantum computing gives that it has a, a quantum byte which is the the, the ability um, for it to be a zero and a one at the same time so obviously having a huge impact on the amount of computational power that it can do this um, image that you're seeing on your screen now uh, a lot of you might be wondering what that is is some kind of a new straw that's being released well this is actually 4d printing so what is 4d printing and how does it differ to 3d printing well still a 3d object gets printed out of that particular printer but once it comes into contact with the environment it starts folding and forming into a particular structure on its own so this is exactly what has happened over here in this particular image what is the use case for this well they are looking at utilizing 4d printers for the colonization of mars as an example um, they will ship up these huge 4d printers up to mars they will then print out these buildings which will automatically form the structures which are going to form the biohabitats for the first people who will go and colonize Mars so it's got very very practical applications for how we're going to move to the next stage of our human existence and that will probably be the colonization of other planets nanobots um, 
is already in, in, in process where these things can be injected into our bloodstream. The nanobot will have the ability to go and sense and pick up and target uh, diseased cells. So here it's got the example of a red blood cell where the red blood cell is diseased. The nanobot will go and target it and destroy that particular red blood cell. So we're seeing this kind of technology uh, happening at this cellular level, but also at the genetic um, level where you're looking at technologies like CRISPR and the ability to um, change gene sequences and implant certain gene sequences that we that we want. And there's a tremendous amount of work that's happening on that at the moment for making resistant strains, for example, um, to any certain fungi uh, in the wine industry and uh, creating those and using CRISPR technology uh, to do those kind of things. Autonomous vehicles uh, we've heard so much about it. There's a wonderful video that uh, is making the rounds on, on YouTube and in social media, which is about uh, Domino's having a pizza delivered uh, to somebody's house using an autonomous vehicle. So they've got autonomous pizza delivery vehicles. And uh, I would encourage you to go and have a look at that particular one. They've actually said that Domino's is no longer a pizza company. Dom Domino's is a, a technology company that just makes pizza because they have embedded so much technology throughout their entire uh, solution. So um, on the route to achieving those full autonomous vehicles, we will have things like this heads up dashboard over here. And this is a Hitachi 2400 smart windshield. Um, I think that before these are mainstream, um, these heads up display, we, we, start, we are seeing some of them, but this has got a tremendous amount of information and a lot of cloud interaction that's happening over here. As an example of that, you see that red car in the image. Well, that's picked up that that particular person has got a driving under the influence conviction in 2012 um, and an expired registration. So maybe you want to steer clear of that particular vehicle. You're chatting to your boss in the lower right hand corner over there. It's telling you where you can pick up your next Starbucks. You've got a bit of a chat window also going on over there. And then in the middle over there, it says it recommends that you upgrade to OS 2.7. All that you've got to do is look at the target and blink uh, rapidly um, to install. So this is the kind of technology that's there but I think that um, the autonomous vehicle um, acceleration uh, curve that we're on we will have those in place long before this becomes mainstream and we'll be get used to just sitting in a vehicle and it uh, taking us to where we want to go. AI um, it's it's kind of impossible to read any technology article these days without the words of AI or machine learning uh, being embedded in that particular article. And that's going to be something that we're going to see more and more in our environment. We are starting to get used to speaking to things like Siri and like Alexa um, and having that uh, that that input um, through, in fact, as I just said, um, Alexa on this chat, so my Echo device uh, lit up. So she is listening to me as we as we speak. <laughs> so we're used to getting that kind of information, and that will be become more and more mainstream and we'll be used to asking for things like the weather and asking for recommendations of restaurants and even going into uh, a store and have, instead of going and asking an information kiosk, having to ask an, an AI and get that information from them as well. On the medical side, uh, the um, the the amount of work that's being done on the side is huge and IBM's Watson has been touted as having a better rate of diagnosis for medical conditions than a GP for example and here's some examples of that on your on your screen um, so Watson has been very very successful uh, in that and we will see more and more of AI where uh, the question gets asked okay well is there no place for doctors in this future well certainly there is because it's difficult to take that holistic view of the, the patient uh, the AI will just be taking the data and will be providing a data solution what a doctor does is it looks at the individual as a whole and sees what kind of person am I doing how am I going to get the maximum compliance out of this person for the the medical regime that I'm going to put them on and ensure that they take the medication, etc. Is there something else that's going on? Are they under stress, etc.? So there's a lot more from a holistic point of view. So certainly there will be the need for human interventions um, as well on that. The next image that you're seeing on, on the screen um, 
I don't know how many of you actually know what's going on over here. Um, if, if I had to ask the question, well, what is happening over here? Are people just on their phones or they're just not being very hospitable? But what they're actually doing is this is people playing Pokemon. And the amazing thing was with, with Pokemon and why I'm showing you this slide is it just was a great example of everything that I've spoken about, of somebody coming up with a particular idea, of them wanting to release that idea localized, to just release it to a local community. But the acceleration rate of that spreading globally was huge. So I'll give you an example. It was launched on the, uh, the 4th of July. Between the 4th and the 10th of July, it went from zero users up to almost 1.2 1.25 million users and that was within the six day period it as i said it was intended to be local but just have a look at this um, image over here of within that six day period where were the users they were globally they were even on some islands um, globally so this shows you that the ability to come up with an idea, if you come up with the right idea, it can spread globally through this network so, so quickly. And if it wasn't for cloud technology, Pokemon could never have scaled. If this was a, a, a solution where they had their own servers and they had launched that, that solution and it scaled to this kind of degree, those servers would have crashed probably within the first three or four hours as Okay, uh, am I back? Should be back, great. Okay, I was saying that we have, we've covered so many different um, elements today and uh, really a lot of information that I've, that I've given you. And I hope that it's given you this feeling of what is the pace that we're, we're going through on this technological adoption curve. And it's not that change is coming. It is that we are living through it at the moment. The stuff is happening around us. It's happening with the customers that we are engaging with. We see customers that we're helping with machine learning solutions, customers that we're helping with IoT solutions, um, customers that we are helping migrate to the cloud that's giving them the ability and the agility to actually do things that they couldn't do before the ability to scale and the ability to really improve their customer service and to help their customers make a lot of these changes so I hope you feel the change I hope that you see these opportunities and that you want to be a part of the of the process I would like to do a last poll um, over here and this is the one on just how do you feel after this presentation? Um, are you excited? Does it make you feel afraid or apprehensive? Or uh, do you really feel, <laughs> damn, you're in, you're all in, you're moving to Mars, you've got the brain computer interface, and you're really keen on everything? Okay, give you another couple seconds just to, to think about where you are. Okay, let's close off that poll and I'll share the details with you. So that's really exciting. I'm, I'm really happy to see 57% of you are excited about this and 43% are all in and moving to Mars <laughs> with it. And I'm there with you. I'm moving to Mars. I've got the brain computer interface. I'm doing all of that stuff. Um, that's really, uh, really great to hear that. And it's, it's really nice to know that there's nobody on this uh, webinar that's afraid or apprehensive because we are all part of creating um, this new environment and it will be what we make of it as we form part of it. So I just want to, to leave you with uh, the, the thought that how do you get involved and how do you do things and certainly one of these ways is to embrace cloud technology because it does allow you for to have that agility it allows you to have that ability to create new things aws is a fantastic platform to uh, experiment with these things to experiment with machine learning iot blockchain technologies etc you really can do it 
a lot easier than it has than it has been uh, in the past. So if you're interested in any of that, please speak to us. Uh, you've got my email address there. It's kevin at cascade.cloud. You can get me on Twitter at, at Kevin DD. Please uh, um, join me on LinkedIn as well. I share a lot of this kind of thinking over there. And uh, with that, I will close off. Um, thank you for joining us. If there are any questions, you're welcome to uh, type them into the question uh, panel and I will answer those questions. Um, otherwise, have an 